35, let's pray. Father, do open our hearts, open our minds, Lord. Take our minds like a garden. Lord, till up the soil of our hearts and minds and plant something tonight in each one of us that'll grow and change us in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, okay, uh, Isaiah chapter 25, verse one. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city a heap, of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy, in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in the dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible one shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death and victory and the Lord shall wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it it shall be said in that day lo this is our God we've waited for him he will save us this is the Lord we've waited for him we we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation for in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest Moab shall be trodden down unto him even as a straw trodden down for the dunghill and he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them as he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim and he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. So, so far, we've been in going through Isaiah. So, so in the book of Isaiah, what have we been seeing so far? Judgment after judgment after judgment, terrible judgments, judgments where the cup of iniquity has been filling up and God says, that's enough. Pride, arrogancy, idol worship, self-righteousness, self-serving, brought down in judgment on the rebellious by the true God, the true God who is the God of Israel. And these have been scenes that Isaiah has seen with such a, a, a vividness in front of his eyes that it has caused him to actually get sick. He actually has been sick over this. He's been in pain. He's, 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 he's talked about some of these visions that he's seen as really doing a number on him. For example, in Isaiah 21, 2, Isaiah 21, 2, he says, a grievous vision is declared unto me. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. But there was a transition that happened in all of this in the book of Isaiah when we hit the last verse of the last chapter, chapter 24 and, the, and verse 23. Things changed because in that ch verse there, what it says is it says, the moon shall be confounded, the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. That's the transition. Finally, finally, Isaiah, who saw the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, sitting high on his throne, he heard the angels singing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. He, he was sent by God at that time. But since then, there's been a lot of judgments, judgments, judgments before then and after them. But finally now he returns to see God gloriously on his throne. And when he sees that, Isaiah steps out of himself and he, de and he declares, he, he has a prayer and he's written the prayer down for us in this chapter. And the prayer starts off with verse 1, verse 1. O Lord, thou art my God. That's that one word that he used there where he said, not just, he didn't say, O Lord, thou art God. 
The one word he used, my, sets Isaiah apart with all the saints who have come to, to, know, to know Jehovah Jesus, and it's that word, my. Because a person can be walking straight down the middle of the road to hell and say, oh Lord, you are God. A person can be, have, a, have a destiny of eternal suffering and have perfect doctrine, believe perfect statements of faith, but yet unless he can say the word, my God, he ain't going to heaven. And my God all hinges on John 1.12. John 1.12, which is where the, the transition happens from, O Lord, you are God, to, O Lord, you are my God, because John 1.12 says, as many as received, speaking of Jesus, as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's the transition verse. When a person becomes what he was not in the past, a child of God. Unlike Nancy Pelosi, who says that everybody's a child of God, but the Bible doesn't agree. Those who receive Jesus Christ are children of God. And to receive Jesus Christ is the pivotal point where Jesus Christ, where people say Jesus Christ is God, to Jesus Christ is my God. And that's what we see in the first verse here. My God. It's a transition that, 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 that happens from just acknowledgement to admiration of Christ. From just knowing what he said to obeying what he said. From just seeing him in the Bible to worshiping him. From just a partial submission to a, I surrender all. Half-hearted to whole heart. All of that happens with the word my. And so this is what we see here. Oh Lord, thou art my God. And then he says, because, he's, he's, because Jehovah Jesus is the God of Isaiah, he says he's going to do something. He's going to lift him up. I will exalt thee. He's going to praise his name. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful name. It's, a, it's no wonder that Satan has chosen that name as a swear word, as a profane word, profanity, to bring down that name. But that name, Jesus, God saves. Christ, the Messiah, the sent one. And all the other wonderful names of God. Great names, kindness, loving, all the God is love, all the names of God are so very important. That's why it's such a tragedy within, uh, within religious Judaism today that they totally don't say the name. They just say, they, well, they say Hashem, they just say the name. Who is it? It's the name. What is the name? No, he has a wonderful name. So Isaiah says, no, I'm going to praise the name. He's not going to praise Hashem, the name. He's going to praise the actual names of God, and that's what he says he's going to do. And that's what the saints should do. That's what we should do. Why? Because in Psalm 145, it says so. Psalm 145, verse 9 says, Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord. Thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth those that fall and raiseth up those that be bowed down. You know what's so great about the museum here, the Creation Earth History Museum? What's so great about the museum is that it, it, it lifts up and it makes known the mighty acts of God. These are mighty acts that God has done in creation. Mighty acts, wonderful acts. We're getting a new book in there. I hope you all get it there by, uh, by Ed Landry. He, he did this book. Uh, it's a great book about creation with great illustrations there. And it just shows the mighty acts of God. And, there's a, and so, now, this is the life purpose of Isaiah. This is his God-given destiny. This lady who was led to Christ over the, uh, the Saturday there by the students, I couldn't believe it that her name was Destiny. <laughs> her name was Destiny, and she comes to be saved. That's her destiny. You found Destiny found her destiny when she came to Christ. But the troubles that happen in our lives 
are very similar to the troubles that happened in Israel's history because God has a design for the troubles that come to us and God has a design for the troubles that come to Israel. And the design of the troubles is told to us in Jeremiah 13, 11. Jeremiah 13, 11 talks about, really it talks about underwear. And I don't want to be gross, I'm just telling you, it's talking about underwear. And it says here in Jeremiah 13, 11, as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, saith the Lord, just a minute, there we go, saith the Lord that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. What is God saying here? Now, I don't know about you, but we all, have, we all think underwear is pretty important. And we are missing it when we don't have it, but we have it, so, and we want it to cling. We want, that's what an underwear does, and I don't want to go into more details than that, but just to say that's what it's supposed to do. And God says that just like underwear cleaves to you, I want you to cleave to me, God says to Israel in this Jeremiah 13, 11. So the troubles that, 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 that we go through and that Israel has gone through is, is meant to make us cling, cling to God. That's what he wants. And so Isaiah has told God a strong statement when he says, you are my God. He's saying, I'm clinging to you, and I've got this strong determination to lift you up and to praise you. Now, Isaiah has said in verse 2 that the works of God can be boiled down to two, two characteristics, two descriptions. First, first faithfulness to what he promised he would do. What he does he has promised, and he's doing what he promised to do. That's faithfulness and truth. It's all about God living up to his word and displaying his word. For example, God has promised in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 16, 18, Proverbs 16, 18, God says, if you see pride, you can be sure destruction is just around the corner. If you see a haughty spirit, you can put your money on the fact there will be a fall. There will be a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so, in verse 2, God is being faithful to this promise because he says in verse 2 that he's made a proud city a pile of rubble. He's made a defense city a ruin. He's made a palace of the haughty and the proud to be no city, and it's never going to be built again. And this is what he's doing here. Now, on the other hand, he's also made promises, as we just saw in Psalm 145, of what he will do for the poor, what he will do for the humble, what he will do for the needy. And it says here in verse 4, Verse four, thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as the, is, is, as, as the storm against a wall. So what we see in verse three, the proud who are strong and terrible, they fall. And God has some advice for them. God's advice for the proud is fear. Let the arrogant fear God and repent and turn to God before it's too late. What we see in verse four is God has some advice for the oppressed, for the oppressed who are poor and needy. And God's advice, so if God's one word for the proud is fear, God's one word for the poor and the needy and oppressed is hope, hope. Let the oppressed hope in God. Hope in God as he has promised in verse four for the strength that they don't have and, for the, and, 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 and also let them hope for in God for protection, protection. We gotta keep in mind that what is happening during this time here and what Isaiah is seeing here is great destruction, great chaos, great danger. And, yet God, and so God is saying the oppressed and the poor, just hope, hope. Because God promises in verse 4 to be a refuge from the storm, a refuge from the storm, a protection, as he says in verse 4, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. 
What we see, we can also derive from verse 1 is God's advice for the redeemed. God's advice for the redeemed is that, is, 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 is that they, they should exalt and praise God as Isaiah has done. Let the redeemed do that. When the world's on fire, proclaim, O Lord, you are my God, and exalt and praise him. Let the redeemed praise God. Psalm 46, 8. Psalm 46, 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in sunder. He burns the chariot in the fire. And then God gives the advice. Next verse, Psalm 46, 10. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the Gentiles. I will be exalted in the earth. When there's destruction all around, God's advice to the redeemed is calm. Be still and know. Rest in the knowledge that Jehovah Jesus is God. He hasn't been dethroned. He hasn't retired. He hasn't turned his back. He hasn't walked away. He will be lifted up and exalted as is, as, as is promised in the Bible. Now, one thing the redeemed should do is know also when they praise God, when we praise God for, during a time of destruction, is that during the time of destruction, during the time when God is judging, there will be some, there will be those who will repent, who will humble themselves and come to believe in Christ also, come to Christ. That's verse three, verse three. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. So this is something, this is something that happened during the time when, when the Jews were about to be destroyed, but then they weren't, in Persia during the time of Esther. And what it says there is that in Esther 8.17, Esther, Esther 8.17, in every province and in every city whithersoever the king's commandment is decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Remember why, the, 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 many of the people of Persia became Jews. And, so, and also during the destruction of Egypt, when Egypt was annihilated and, and reduced to rubble after the ten plagues, then what happened was that they, the, the, the Israel left, but when they left, there's just a little tiny tiny little, almost like a parenthesis in Exodus 12, 38. Exodus 12, 38, about a certain group that went with the multitude, and they're just called the mixed multitude in, a, in Exodus 12, 38, where it says, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. So it's almost like you, as, as, as God's giving a scan of all the people who are leaving Egypt, and he says, okay, there's the flocks, there's the herd, there's very much, oh, look over there. There's a group of mixed multitude. Who are those? Egyptians. Those are Egyptians who were never called Egyptians after that. The mixed multitude became an inter, uh, intermarried group. They just became Jews. And so when we see the great destruction coming on the earth, which, by the way, is not very far off, that's the time when we should be praying also that God will get his harvest out of that. And that's also the time when we should be praying too that God would teach us a lesson and the lesson is Hebrews 12, 13, Hebrews 12, 13, uh, 14, Hebrews 12, 14, here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We, as I've said before, we all are, temporary residents, we all have green cards on earth. This is not a continuing place for us. We're leaving, we're on this earth, the earth is rotten, the earth is getting worse, but we're leaving. So we're going to, one day we're going to say, farewell, crew world. They're not gonna say I'm off to join the Navy, but we're gonna say, <laughs> farewell, crew world. I'm off to my continuing city. We're looking for one to come. And in that regard, Abraham is our model. Abraham is our model. Rich man that he was, never had a house. Refused to have a house. Refused to build a foundation and a house. Instead, lived in tents all of his life. If you met Abraham, 
he'd probably have on his lapel, he'd have a little pin and it'd be a tent because that's Abraham. And that's the way we should be too. God wants us to look at this world and to look at it and to say, here have, we no continue, here have I no continuing city. I seek one to come. And so, but in this first verse, God is really giving a advice for every person, and that person is, stake God out to be your God. Make God your God. Be like Isaiah, who, you, who says, O Lord, in verse one, thou art my God. That's God's advice to everyone. Make God your God. Because God wants, that's, that's the work of God. What's the work of God today? Reconciliation. God is in the reconciling business. You know, it always reminds me, I, uh, whenever, unfortunately, more than a few times we have been in court, we always seem to find ourselves in court for one reason or another. Um, but anyway, always it's interesting that the judge always encourages the party to settle, settle. Don't go to court. Settle. Have settlement conferences, have settlement meetings, and so forth. God's in the settlement business. He's in the settlement business. And, his, his, and, and 2 Corinthians 5.19, 2 Corinthians 5.19 is the judge, is the judge saying, would you just um, reconcile with Jesus Christ? And uh, to wit, God was, 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. I want to stop there for a second. Let's just kind of look at ourselves as if we were in the court system and we are appointed by the court to bring two warring parties together in a reconciliation. That's what reconciliation is. And because he says that he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, Goes on in 2 Corinthians 5.20, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now again, we look at verse 4, and it teaches us that God is going to weaken the strong, He's going, to, he's going to weaken the self-confident, but he's going to strengthen the weak. He's going to strengthen the God-confident person. God's going to do that because the Bible describes the, 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 the weak as having an armor, an armor of righteousness in 2 Corinthians 6, 7. 2 Corinthians 6, 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness. And the armor of righteousness is, goes on to describe it there in 2 Corinthians 6, 7, as saying the armor of righteousness is on the right hand and on the left. It's on both hands. It's a complete protection from both sides. And, this, and God says, you're gonna need it because in verse four it says the blast of the terrible ones is gonna be like the wind of the storm against the wall. And, and unfortunately I've gone through a hurricane or two down in Loretto, it's not very pleasant at all. And I can tell you one thing, when those strong wind, those 100 mile an hour winds, it's one thing when they blow by, but when they hit a wall they make a terrible noise, a big sound. And, and God says in verse five, verse five, that he will bring down the noise of strangers, the noise of strangers. God describes the strangers, the enemies, as just making a noise. That's the way God talked about Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Pharaoh looked pretty awesome. He looked pretty, pretty scary, I should say. He looked pretty scary. He looked pretty terrible. But God said in Jeremiah 46, 17, Jeremiah 46, 17, they did cry there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He hath passed the time appointed. So God looked at Pharaoh and says, it's only a noise. It's just making a noise. That's all. I mean, right now, as you read through this, as you read through our, our, our report here on the, on, the, on, the, on the distribution of the two million, you're going to open up the front here and you're going to see all of these, the, the, these people that are opposing the distribution and they're setting up phone numbers and they're enlisting volunteers and they're trying to get legislation. And you know what? God looks at all this and says, it's just a noise. It's just a noise. That's all. That's just a noise. <laughs> okay. And so, now we read in verse 6 about a great feast 
that God has made. Look at verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves, well refined. Oh, this is a great feast. This is, trim- this is wonderful. And if you, go, you, you, you look at the feast and you say, oh, it's an obvious celebration. What are we celebrating? What are we celebrating? And God will say, we are celebrating Jehovah Jesus, the Lamb of God, for taking away the sins of the world. This is a celebration feast for that. And we see in verse 6 that this is such a special feast that God says, I'm not going to let angels prepare this feast. I'm going to do it myself. And so we read in verse 6, verse 6, the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast. God's making that feast. Wow. What do you think it'd be like to refuse to come to a feast that God has put together? Not a good idea to refuse that. But we all know how much work there is to making a feast. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And God has gone to a lot of work to make this feast. And so it's very important that everybody come who's invited. Which brings us to the next point. Who is invited? Who is this feast for? God says in verse 6, the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast. So he's preparing this feast. Is it only for the Jewish people? No, it's for all people. Is it just for the elect? No, it's for all people. It's for, he's making a feast of all, for all people. He's made out his invitation. He's called out. These are his calling cards in Isaiah 55.1. Isaiah 55.1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy. Eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. So people would come to this feast and they say, how much does it cost? To get in, what's the entrance fee? Nothing. God says nothing. All it is, you're thirsty, come. You're, 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 you're hungry, come. It's free to everyone. Why? Because God says in 1 Timothy 2.4, 1 Timothy 2.4, he will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3.9, 2 Peter 3.9, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He swings open the door of this feast, and he says, come one, come all. He swings open this fe- the door of the feast, he says, I don't want to see one person not come to this feast. It's for all people. But the tragedy is, not everybody comes. That's the tragedy. The invitation is set out, the meal is prepared, it's free, all you got to do is just come, hungry, thirsty, Matthew 22, 1. Matthew 22, 1. Jesus, playing off of Isaiah 25, 6, says a parable to elaborate Isaiah 25, 6. And Jesus said in Matthew 22, 1, Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, i.e., the Lord of hosts from Isaiah 25, 6. A certain king which made a marriage for his son, i.e., a great feast from Isaiah 25, 6. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they, were not, they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the marriage, i.e., the Lord made a feast in Isaiah 25, 6. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. In the rest of this parable, Jesus goes on to say, go out and invite everybody, i.e., Isaiah 25, 6, the Lord made a feast unto all people. Now, in verse 6, in Isaiah 25, 6, a menu is published before the feast. Come to the feast, here's the menu in verse 6, verse 6, a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, a fat things full of marrow, chamorro. Oh, great stuff. What do you call it? Lamb, beef shank, shank bones. Good stuff. A, fee, a wine on the leaves well refined. 
this is going to be a feast of fat things. There's not going to be anything on the menu that says light or, or fat free or 2% or anything. No. This is all going to be good stuff. Special wines, parts of the meat that have got marrow in it. Oh, it's going to be great. Now this is, a, this is called, in the book of Revelation, this feast is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. This verse 6 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 9, 19, 7, 19, 7, the people are coming and they're saying, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God, now, there's great stuff here, as we saw, all this fat stuff, muy rico. This is fantastic stuff here, and the Lord's going to make all that. It's a, what, so what's, what's the occasion? It's a celebration of life. Life, life, lachayim, life. A celebration of life from the dead. Therefore, only the best foods and, and wines are brought out because the death of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is the event that caused there to be life from the dead. That's the celebration. When you get your, your, your <coughs> when you got the, when you saw the, 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 the invitation to the feast, it would say, celebration of life from the dead. That's exactly what the father ordered when the prodigal son returned. The father for the prodigal son said in Luke 15, 22, Luke 15, 22, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither, hither the fatted calf, not that skinny one, the fatted one, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found. The father ordered the fatted calf to be killed and eaten because he said, this my son was dead and is alive again. That's the theme in verse six. Of verse six, the Lord is making a feast of all of fat things, of all, to all people of fat things, a feast of wines. This is the feast in verse six. God is gonna be joyfully pointing to all of those people just like that father of the prodigal son pointed to his prodigal son and said, this my son was dead and is alive again. And God will be at all the feasts and he'll say, these my children were dead and they're alive again. We're gonna have a great feast and, 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 and bring out the best, the best. It reminds me of the, the, you know, the Israelis who come Sarah knows. The Israelis who come down there and the last dinner we make for them and, and, I, and I, I bring out the best meat. Which, by the way, now I know you haven't been to, if you want to write down something important in your notes, this is important. The best beef is Brant beef. B-R-A-N-D-T. I don't have a Bible reference for that, but that's okay. <laughs> Brant beef from El Centro, the Brant family, they have the best beef. 90% of it goes to Japan. But we, and so we bring out these brand beef New York steaks with a nice f wide ribbon of fat around the outside and thin fat veins running through the meat. I can taste it now. You know, fat has been given a bad rap. Let me tell you. Fat has been, I'm here to tell you, fat has been given a bad rap but this fat is bursting with flavor. The Brandt family feed the molasses, corn, grains, wonderful. Anyway, that's what we're talking about. Well, I don't, it doesn't say Brandt beef in verse six, but it says feast of fat things. Okay, great feast, celebration. So there is in verse six and seven an emphasis on where this feast is gonna take place. And in verse six, it says, in this mountain, shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a, fe a, fe a feast of fat things. Now, and also in verse seven, it says he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering. That mountain is a mountain called Zion. That's Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Mount Zion is actually, you probably look at it and say, that's a mountain? Well, God calls it a mountain, it's a mountain. So, but it's actually a, an area 
on the Temple Mount was on Mount Zion. That's not all that was on Mount Zion. Also, there's a hill, a a little hill, that's part of Mount Zion, and that hill is called Golgotha, or Calvary, which is where Jesus Christ died on the cross. And this great celebration is going to take place on Mount Zion, right there at Mount Calvary, where Jesus died on the cross. And verse 7 tells us the reason or one of the reasons this celebration feast is going to be on Mount Calvary, it's because there's several reasons, but one of them in verse 7 is that he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. It's because on Mount Calvary, Jesus Christ destroys, on, in, in verse 7, the, what's called the covering or the veil that spread over all nations. Now actually, in verse 7, when it uses the word destroy, it's the word swallow. He will swallow up the covering or the veil that is over all nations. A covering, in verse 7, blocks the vision. Don't think of the veil like we have in our weddings where the the bride sees the... No, that reminds me of um, my friend's um, uh, son that uh, that married um, my friend my friend who who is ultra orthodox Hasidic and and wedding and and his son was marrying uh, a, a lady from Montreal Canada so I went up there for that wedding it was quite something but anyway the when they brought the bride out they brought her out she had a veil in front of her she couldn't see anything she couldn't see anything kind of interesting they bring they brought the veil out they brought her out in the veil and then i think it was the father yeah it was the father of the of the groom that came and he was allowed to lift the veil and look at her just to make sure it it, it wasn't leia <laughs> and i'm not kidding that's really the reason for that tradition make sure that they didn't switch it with another sister which anyway but the point is is that what i'm not i'm not that's not the point the point is is that the veil is absolutely opaque she could not see out of it so much so she couldn't walk she had her mother hold her right arm she had her sister hold her left arm and they led her out there because she couldn't see she couldn't see This is the type of veil we're talking about in verse 7. A veil that is blinding. A veil that is blocking vision. A veil in verse 7 that is spread over all nations. A veil keeps a person from seeing who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did. It's the veil that is now over the peoples of all the nations that block their sight of Jesus Christ. And there are several types of veils that block the sight of Jesus Christ. For example, there is the blinding veil of religious traditions. Religious traditions. The veil of irrational superstitions, such as, well, you know, the bread and the wine, they actually become the literal blood and body of Jesus Christ. That's a veil that blocks the vision of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, that cow over there is sacred. You can't touch that cow. That's a veil that blocks the vision of Jesus Christ. They can't see through the the blinding veil of religion. Then there's the blinding veil of self-righteousness. A blinding veil of self-righteousness that blocks the vision of Christ. That's a veil of the irrational thought that that says that that, uh, I looked in the mirror and I think I'm really a good person. Actually, to the core, I'm a really good person. That's blinding. That's a veil of the original thought, that's the uh, irrational thought that says that I've done some things wrong, but that's on one side of the balance, but I'm just going to outweigh it all by putting good stuff, good things I do on the other side, the side of there. That's the blinding veil of self-righteousness. And they cannot see through the blinding veil of self-righteousness. And then there's the blinding veil of pleasures and passions, what makes me feel, thrills, pornography, drugs, alcoholism, thrills of the flesh. That's a blinding veil of pleasures and passions. Can't see Jesus Christ through that veil. And then there's the veil, the blinding veil of worldliness, worldliness. 
Everything on the horizontal is what fills my vision. My career fills my vision. My reputation fills my vision. My building and building and building fills my vision. My vacations, my cruises, my fine dining, my sports. Everything on this is worldliness and it blinds and you cannot see through the veil of the blinding veil of worldliness. And then there's the blinding veil of intellectual pride that blocks the sight of Jesus Christ. This is the blinding veil that says, if I can't understand it, I won't believe it. This is the veil of, I can't see God, therefore I won't believe in God. This is the blinding veil that blocks the vision. It's the blinding veil of intellectual pride. And then, the one that particularly all the summer blitzers ran against, the one that the LA outreach people are running against, the ones that all the people distributing the books in Israel is the veil of, the blinding veil of prejudice against Jesus Christ. You say the name Jesus Christ, oh, don't say that name. That's prejudice. Prejudice blocks the sight of Jesus Christ. That's the veil that that you encounter when you go to the Jewish people especially. The veil of, you know, we weren't allowed to say that name in our home when I grew up. That's the veil of, you know, the murderers and haters of other Jews and the ones that spilled their blood. They all believed in Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is the enemy. That's prejudice against Jesus Christ, and it blocks the, ve- the sight of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 14. 2 Corinthians 3, 14. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when their heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So this great celebration in verse 6 is over the fact that on that Mount Calvary, Jesus Christ swallows up and destroys all the blinding veils that block the view of Jesus Christ. Might be that, or might be, because also on that mount in Jerusalem will be the place where Jesus Christ returns and destroys all the nations that are coming against the Jewish people. Maybe, perhaps, that is referring to the destruction of the blinding veils that block the vision of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter, both are both possible. Now, <clears throat> that's one reason for the, the celebration feast in verse six. But most of all, the reason for the celebration in verse six is gonna be a great celebration over what Christ did on Mount Calvary as part of Mount Zion in verse eight. There, it says, he swallows up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. The mouth of the Lord, for the Lord has spoken it. It's on Mount Calvary is the Gettysburg battleground of uh, uh, of heaven. That's where the great battle took place on the cross. And before that, when the armies of hell led by the devil, were all assembled in a mass there. Jesus Christ looked over the ground at them, and he looked squarely in the face of the death and the grave, and he said these words, Hosea 13, 14. Hosea Hosea 13, 14, before the battle started, he said, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Those were his words before the battle started. And the battle took place, and the winner was 2 Timothy 1.10. 2 Timothy 1.10, our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Death was defeated there. Death that dogged our steps through life. Death that put a dark shadow over all our, our, our days with a fear of death. We lived through an overspreading shadow of death in our lives that ruined our dreams of any permanent friendship with anybody. Death will end it. 
that overspreading shadow of death in our lives ruined our dreams of any permanent home. You can put a sign on the home. We put the signs on the home, home sweet home. Not for long. Not until death comes. That overspreading shadow of death in our lives that ruined our dreams of any continuing joy and happiness. That overspreading shadow of death in our lives that ruined our dreams of permanently having something. That overspreading shadow of death in our lives that ruined any dreams of a permanent peace, a security. All those dreams that the overspreading shadow of death ruined brought tears to our eyes. And now in verse 8, Jesus Christ has swallowed up death in victory. And as for those tears, verse 8, the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. God himself makes the feast. God himself gets out the Kleenex box and wipes the tears away from those. As he says in Isaiah 66, 13, Isaiah 66, 13, as one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Verse 8, <clears throat> God wipes away tears from all eyes. It will be the Revelation 7.17. Revelation 7.17, the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, lead them into living waters, fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation 21.4, Revelation 21.4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things passed away. And the basis for all this comfort and God wiping away the tears and comforting is simply, verse 8, verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory. It's gone. It's gone. Death is conquered. The power of death is it's broken. The resurrection of Christ, he broke through the bars. Death cannot keep his prey. The grave was seen as going to ready to swallow up Christ, but oh no, Christ swallowed up the grave. And the grave became a conquered enemy, the last enemy, death, he defeated. Death, before, was seen as the termination of all good. Now death is the entrance of all that's good in heaven. And death became for us. When he swallowed up death, death became for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That is quoting from this verse, Isaiah 25, 6. Isaiah 25, 6. So when all those blinding veils are destroyed in verse 7, and Jesus Christ is seen on the cross for who he is and what he's done, then people will hear what he said from the cross. And what he said from the cross is Isaiah 45, 22. Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, for there is none else. When the people of Israel were bit by the firing ser fiery serpents and God told Moses, make a brass serpent and put it on a pole, and then God says, look at it. Just look at it and be saved from the venom. And Jesus said that he would be, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, John three fifteen that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so he says, <clears throat> as if the serpent on the as if as if he's the serpent on the pole he is the sacrifice on the cross and he says the same thing that Moses said look unto me and be ye saved all ye ends of the earth 
And now there is no looking unto Jesus. There is a turning away from Jesus on the cross. There is the, today it's a day of Isaiah 53.3. Isaiah 53.3, where he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the response is, we hid as it were our faces from him. Because he's despised and we esteemed him not. No longer. Isaiah 53.3 will be no more prejudice against, the, against Jesus Christ. No longer turning away. No longer hiding the face. But, the, but then it will be the full invitation of God will be heard from the cross. And the full invitation is actually in Isaiah 45.19. Isaiah 45.19 where God says, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seeking me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image. Pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye, bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from the ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There's none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is none else. I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So instead of Jesus Christ seen on the cross and turning away, it will be a day when Jesus Christ is seen on the cross and there will be the bending of the knee and there will be the singing of the song. How can it be? that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. And when that happens, it's going to be Philippians 2.6. Philippians 2.6, they're going to see Jesus Christ, who is in the form of God, but he thought it not equal robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself, look at him there on the cross, he made himself of no reputation, he took upon him the form of a servant, he was made in the likeness of man, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Taken right from Isaiah 25, 8. Isaiah 25, 8. The world mocks, the world mocks today, mocks believer. That's your God? That's your God? Being tortured on a cross? The world says, where's your God? Where's your God? Psalm 79.10, Psalm 79.10. Where sh wherefore should the heathen say, where is their God? God says, a day is coming, a day called in that day, when the response will be, finally, believers will respond to mockers in verse 9, Isaiah 25, 9, verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that day coming. And help us, Lord. Help us to, to, to live today with that day in our sight. In Jesus' name, amen.